Um, hello everyone, I'm Hari, and this is work done at Rutgers University with my amazing collaborators here. Uh, let's verify the EBPF verifier. So here's a quick summary of my talk. The EBPF verifier is essential to the safety and security of the EBPF ecosystem. And static analysis is a cu crucial part of this EBPF verifier. But despite our best efforts, writing correct static analysis is really hard. And this is where formal verification tools can be put to good use. Uh, we present a tool called Agni based on formal verification that automatically checks the correctness of part of the static analysis in the verifier on every commit. Agni reports that the static analysis in the kernels 513 to 519, the latest we checked, are correct. And for prior kernels, Agni reported that the static analysis has bugs. And Agni can generate proof of concept eBPF programs that manifest these bugs in the eBPF verifier. Mainly, I'd like to use this talk to solicit feedback from the, this wonderful community. So please give, give us feedback. OK, so the static analysis in the eBPF verifier must be sound. Soundness means that the verifier should reject unsafe programs where safety refers to some of these properties. And in doing so, it may reject some safe programs, but that's OK. But writing correct static analysis is really hard. In the recent year, there have been seven vulnerabilities in the CVE database related to bugs in the static analysis in the verifier. And they've been exploited and threatened to undermine the uh, eBPF ecosystem. So with my research, we sought out to answer the question, can we formally verify the soundness of the static analysis in the eBPF verifier? This brings us to the goals of our work. We want to make sure that the kernel static analysis is sound on every commit. Now the verifier is a large code base that is constantly changing with fixes to old algorithms and static analysis and new algorithms to support new eBPF instructions. And one option we have is to manually encode the kernel uh, eBPF verifier code into logic on every commit, perform the verification, talk to developers, and fix issues. But I can tell you from experience that this is not fun, and uh, it, it's very tedious and also error prone. So we thought it would be a good idea to automate this process. So how do we automate? Our goal is to start from the source code of the kernel on any commit. We develop a tool that automatically extracts the semantics of the eBPF verifier C code into logic rather than manually writing them. We develop soundness conditions to specify when the kernel static analysis is sound. And then we perform verification using an SMT solver. OK, sometimes we find that the particular kernel commit is sound. That's great. We have a sound verifier. But what if our soundness checks fail? We care about the real world. Can this soundness violation be actually manifested through an actual user supplied eBPF program? And this is where we go ahead and synthesize a proof of concept eBPF program that demonstrates a mismatch between the concrete eBPF bytecode semantics and the abstract verifier semantics. And this allows us to weed out the false positive from the real bug reported by the SMT solver. OK, so this figure shows a non-exhaustive list of the various kinds of analyses done by the eBPF verifier. And the focus of my work has been on the value tracking analysis done by the verifier, which tracks the values of program variables or registers. Uh, the values program variables or registers can take across all executions. To make the sorry, to make the analysis practical, the verifier over approximates the set of actual values of program variables using abstract values from an abstract domain. Uh, the verifier uses two domains for value tracking, the bitwise domain and the range domain. And these two components learn from each other, making reasoning about the soundness of this combination a little complicated. So let's see the bitwise tracking analysis. The verifier uses the bitwise domain to track individual bits of a program variable. The kernel calls this the domain of tri-state numbers because for the purposes of tracking, each bit in a variable can either be known to be 0, known to be 1, or unknown, denoted here as mu. So let's see an example. Let's look at variables as if they had only four bits. And suppose we want to track the individual bits of a four-bit register, R2, in this eBBF program symbol. Tnum R2 can be used to track R2. And initially, we don't know anything about R2, so all of R2 is, tnum R2 is set to unknown. And on line one, R2 is the result of the logical and of some unknown external variable called input with eight. And even though we don't know anything about input, we can say for sure that R2's least significant three bits are certainly zero. Only the most significant bits may be set, if at all. As R2 undergoes further operations, the value of tnum R2 is accordingly updated. And importantly, the information encoded in tnum R2 can be used to determine the infer that the value of R2 will only be either four or six in all, all executions. And this can later be determined to use the safety of the memory access at line five that depends on the value of R2. Now, the kernel specifies algorithms for abstract operations on abstract values, 
corresponding to the BPF operators. The soundness of the verifies analysis depends on the soundness of its abstract operator. Uh, shown here is the Linux kernel's implementation of TNUM AND corresponding to BPF bitwise AND. So how can we say that TNUM AND is sound? Let's look at how we can think about soundness of an abstract operator such as TNUM AND. Let's say we have two TNUMs, P and Q, and they are tracking program variables X and Y. If P is tracking X, then X has to be a member of P. Uh, what does this mean? So using a previous example, if P is the TNUM 0, 1, mu, 0 from earlier, then member of P, 4 returns true, whereas member of P, 1 will return false. Uh, similarly, since Q is tracking Y, Y has to be a member of Q. Um, and let's say that Z is the result of the bit, BPF bitwise AND operator on X and Y. And R is the result of the TNUM AND of TNUMs, P and Q which corresponds to the implementation I showed before. To see whether a TNUM app operator, uh, whether a TNUM AND operator is sound, we can ask the question, is it ever possible that TNUM AND produces an output where Z is not a member of R? And we can prepare a logic formula that looks like the one here and present it to an SMT solver. There are, there are efficient solvers out there that can find satisfying assignments to these variables in the formula. And if the solver finds a satisfying assignment, this means that we have a problem and TNUM AND could be unsound. Okay, all that might be pretty straightforward, but if you recall, I also mentioned that the EVVF verifier also does range tracking. It uses an upper and lower bound to track a range of possible values a variable can take across all executions. Formally, this is called the interval domain. And if you use a previous example again, the range of program register R2 can be, can be tracked using the abstract value interval R2. Interval R2 starts with a maximum possible range for four-bit variables, 0, 15, and after line, three concludes that the interval R2 is 0, 6, which means that the value of R2 will always be between 0 and 6. But recall our analysis in the TNUM domain. It was more precise because it was able to infer that the value of X will only be one of two values, 4 and 6. This begs the question, can the range analysis somehow learn from the TNUM analysis? And the answer is yes, and this is also what happens in the verifier. This brings us to the idea of refinement in formal methods using abstract values in one domain to update the results in another domain in order to improve the precision of the analysis. If we use the information in the TNUM domain, we can update the range from 0, 0,6 to 4, 6 in the interval domain, which is more precise than what we had before. Okay, now let's see how we can reason about the soundness of refinement. Note that this is not what happens in the Linux kernel, it's just how someone maybe with a formal method background would think. Uh, consider this program snippet that we have here where R7 is the result of the addition of R5 and R6. And let's say at this program point, the two analyses in the interval and the TNUM domains are tracking R5 and R6 and they have these specific abstract values. Because there is an addition, we can perform an addition in the interval domain to obtain 8,10. We can also perform an addition in the TNUM domain to obtain mu, 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 zero. Now we define a new operator called the refinement operator that takes two output abstract values from different domains and combines them into an output value in a particular domain. Here the refinement operator produces an output in the TNUM domain. And TNUM R7 is calculated to be one mu mu zero by the refinement operator, which is indeed more precise than what we had before, mu 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 zero. Okay, so but what about the soundness of this entire process? Typically we reason inductively, which is that if we prove that the soundness of the abstract operators in each domain is sound, and separately prove that the refinement is sound, we can claim that the entire analysis is sound. And this is what we call modular reasoning. Modular reasoning makes our life easier because we can think about individual components, prove their soundness independently, and claim that the entire process is sound. But unfortunately, this is not what happens in the EVF verifier. We start with the initial, same initial abstract values in both the interval and abstract domains, and the TNUM addition operator produces an abstract result as usual. However, the verifier de defines an operator for the interval domain which isn't the typical refinement operator we saw before. It consumes input from the interval domain directly without producing an intermediate interval result. So we cannot modularly prove the soundness of the entire process by proving the soundness of individual components, and that's why we have to prove the soundness of the entire analysis in one shot. So here's an overview of all the eBPF verifiers uh, value tracking domains. It uses four variants of interval abstract domains. Um, for example, the S32 abstract domain 
tracks an upper bound and lower bound of a program register when interpreted as a signed 32-bit value. And we've already seen the TNUM domain from before. And as we also saw, the eBPF verifier also performs refinements, which are non-standard from conventional formal methods. The effect is that ultimately, the eBPF verifier does abstract operator, uh, operators that uh, defines abstract operator that operate on abstract values drawn from a combination of these different domains. So how to think about the soundness for multiple domains in one shot? Here are the constraints you saw before for a single domain previously, TNUM. And here are the new constraints for multiple domains with the changes in red. This is similar to what we had before, but the abstract values P and Q are now a combination of abstract values from all domains. And the abstract operator, uh, the, the abstract operator is also one that modifies the abstract values in all domains in one shot. And this is the code snippet from the eBWF verifier that performs operations on abstract values for ALU uh, operations. The top level function contains a switch case for each uh, ALU operation. As we are interested in bitwise AND, we need to look at the BPF AND part of the snippet. And each of these uh, cases performs several function calls. And you can see also you, there is a call for TNUM AND here. Uh, to prefer a logic formula, we need to encode this slice of the eBPF verifier's code. And this is where I wanted to highlight the importance of automation. It would have been very tedious and error prone to extract the correct abstract operators in logic manually. So Agni's automated verification supports the usual arithmetic and logic operators listed here. We exclude multiplication from an analysis because its implementation contains a loop, which needs to be unrolled when converted to logic, which leads to a very large formula and verification times out. We also support the following jump abstract operators. An important feature of Agni's verification is that the constraints are strict. It only reports bugs that happen during program verification. Uh, as an example, there was a recent post on the kernel mailing list where a fuzzer discovered a bug that occurs only when the verifier followed a branch that could never be taken during an actual EBPF program execution. Agni does not report this bug, and this is a good thing because we don't want to de burden developers with too many false positives. It is, however, easy to weaken the constraint, and by doing so, Agni was indeed able to discover this bug. Okay, so here are the results when we ran Agni on a few major kernels. It proved that some of the newer kernels are sound, but Agni reports that these other kernels have abstract operators that are unsound. So what do we do about them? Even with strong constrained static analysis like ours can generate a lot of false positives. We wanted to know whether these soundness violations are actually possible to be manifested by real eBPF programs. And how can we do that? By generating actual eBPF programs that expose bugs. Now, I wanted to highlight that generating eBPF programs is hard because you cannot simply achieve any arbitrary abstract state in the verifier. Consider the realm of all possible abstract values. Let's say using our soundness constraints from before, we see that the abstract operator B and is unsound. This means that there exists some abstract values P and Q to the abstract operator that cause unsound behavior. Now, the eBPF verifier begins with all abstract values set to some initial values and it is possible that P and Q do not belong to this initial set of values. However, it might be possible that the verifier can reach these values by using some sequence of abstract operators applied to this initial set. Crafting the right sequence of abstract operators is challenging because it requires manipulation of abstract values across a combination of these abstract domains. At a high level, we use a technique that is a combination of a program enumerator and a solver. The enumerator generates skeletons of EBPF programs with holes for opening. The solver fills in the holes with values such that the program will manifest bugs. Uh, Agni's synthesis supports uh, ALU and jump instructions from before. Uh, and I also wanted to highlight that adding support for, for jump instructions was difficult but critical because jump instructions manipulate abstract values in ways in which purely ALU instructions are not able to, allowing us to explore uh, more abstract states. So yeah, I just wanted to give a small demo of the synthesis part. So um, yeah, this is a video here. So we have a collection of uh, the bugs synthesized by Agni uh, in this directory. And I'm going to go into the 5.8 kernel. And here are all the BPF programs which are actually can trigger a bug in the kernel. So if you, I'm just going to give an example of one program, which is, and all of these programs are uh, such programs. Um, and what 
what I'm going to do next is uh, I'm going to uh, we're going to go into an actual kernel that is running 5.8 and see if it's possible to uh, see the bug that we have that that Agni has generated. Um, so I'm just running the script here. So what you can see here is that, uh, as I am going to highlight here, S32 this eBPF program, and this is the uh, just a part of the verifier log. This eBPF program generates an instruction that uh, uh, generates and generated an instruction that produced S32 min value, which is uh, greater than S32 max value, and that should never be the case in a sound uh, verifier where the minimum bounds is greater than the maximum bounds for a particular register. So, and these are, uh, so Agni has produced all these eBPF programs that you saw before, which have, which exhibit similar behavior in the verifier, which exhibit unsound. So I just wanted to highlight that uh, not, not only does the developer know that there is a bug, but the developer also has an actual proof of concept eBPF program that they can run in the verifier and see the bug manifesting. So here's a summary of our results. Uh, and I said before, we used Agni to verify 16 kernel versions, and out of these, we found that nine were unsound. And in the unsound kernel versions, we discovered 27 previously unknown soundness violations and 93 known ones. And these known violations were part of eight well-documented CVEs. And Agni is able to produce a proof of concept EPF program in 97% uh, of the cases where it found soundness violations. And for those interested, uh, here are some numbers for run times and peak memory consumption for two representative kernel versions, 5.9, which Agni found to be unsound, and 5.19, which was indeed found to be sound. Proving that a kernel is sound takes longer. Uh, in unsound kernels like 5.9, the SMT solver can stop after finding a soundness violation and then proceeds to synthesizing it. The peak memory consumption is in the range of 16 gigabytes. So, I want to conclude with saying that we have put some decent amount of engineering effort into this, and we would like developers to use this tool. And our goal going forward is to make Agni as push button as possible, and your feedback would be immensely valuable with this. Concretely, we want to work on reducing verification time. As you saw before, it uh, it takes a lot of time to maybe um, around a couple uh, around a day at least to verify a kernel. And I would like to give a shout out to Paul Chenyo for his efforts to parallelize Agni. Uh, so that each BPF instruction can be verified in parallel. We also want to explore profiling the verification to identify bottlenecks, and we also want to ensure that the code extraction from C to logic can support future kernel versions reliably. And we also have some interesting avenues for future exploration as well. And with that, I'm happy to uh, ask, uh, happy to have you ask questions. Uh, I have a question. Um, feedback. How easy it is for kernel developers to extend Agni with new instructions? What's your take on that? Yeah, it should be if you have if uh, if you have a concrete semantics for that instruction clearly defined as the EBPF instruction set, and uh, you you know what is what part of the verifier code. Uh, if it's similar to like ALU instructions we saw before, like there's a switch case then Agni is easily able to extract the semantics of that instruction and uh, you can perform the verification if you can if you can uh, specify the semantics of the concrete part and the abstract part easily then it's straightforward and i think we should add all these generated test cases from the previous kernel to the to rci i mean that would definitely be uh, useful as well yeah definitely we have a lot of these cases and each of these Cases uh, are, an, are a concrete demonstration of a mismatch in the semantics, so that'll be great. And yeah, we are actually adding this validation check that the range is well formed and uh, with special flag, we will, you know, reject the program. So it will be actually easier to detect this. In your case, right, like you've shown uh, the verifier log, 
Yeah. But human has to go and look at like, oh, this, this doesn't look right. So now we'll have like enforcement basically. So you, you're saying you will have an enforcement if the verifier finds that uh, yes. there is a case where there is a mismatch in the... Yeah, yeah. There, there is patch stat right now under review, but like, and, and it's just like small part of that. But uh, basically like after each modification for LU uh, operations or for conditionals, we check that like all the ranges are well formed and if they are not by default we reset them to like unknown basically I see. Uh, but like if you specify a new flag that bpf tests sanity checks whatever strict some some name uh, which you can specify when you load the program basically and uh, in that case like when we detect this violation we'll, we'll reject this the message see. so that should help you with writing the test case but i mean just a question isn't that uh, i mean an issue with the verifier that the uh, that the analysis isn't sound, and that's why it went into a state where... Um... Yes and no. So there are known situations where, like, we don't detect, uh, you know, like, dead branches, basically. And when we have dead branches, we have non-overlapping ranges, but right. we still try to combine them. And when you combine non-overlapping ranges, you get invalid range very often. Right. And we just... Well, right now we accept that this is possible because, I don't know, we, we haven't patched up all the different cases and all the stuff. Uh, so. Yeah, I remember, I think that that, uh, that uh, example that I, show, that I showed was one of those cases where there were non-overlapping ranges, the verifier followed one dead branch. Uh, that was the recent post in the mailing list, right? Yeah. yeah. I think like in terms of the CI integration, once we would get there, right, it would probably be useful to have this at least one once a day if possible, uh, depending how much this can be paralyzed and their time shrunk down so that it's still easy to bisect what's what change introduced this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think the main, uh, yeah, I mean, we've been trying to reduce the verification time a bit. And but also it's kind of and make it as push button as possible so you can just uh, like have it with ci just it'll take some while you don't need to monitor it uh yeah if, if we get to that point make it as push button as possible then it'll be yeah. and one thing that would be super useful uh if you have the cycles for it to basically check the current patches that are going on and the mailing yeah. list to the soundness validation yeah, I, right i mean yeah definitely that was uh, that's immediately the next thing that i was planning to do after the conference uh, to check Andrew's patches, but uh, one, I think there is, there is, there was the last time I tried it, there was some one breaking change with respect to our uh, code being able to handle it. So I think, but it should be doable to handle the patches. Yeah, question on behalf of people that are maintaining BPFCI, like what are the runtime dependencies for like this approach? Like if if you were to integrate it into CI, like what what kind of things you expect to to have? Right. So our dependencies are we. Uh, the C2 logic extraction that depends on um, uh, the Clang tool chain. We need LLVM. Uh, we, we basically convert the C code into IR, perform some uh, LLVM passes on that, and then convert it to logic. It also depends on the Z3 SMT solver. Uh, and uh, is that available as like a Linux package that we can just install, or like how much work would it be to to get it into GitHub Action Worker, basically? Uh, how much work would it be to get So we, we use GitHub Actions, right, for right. CI. Like, and so we have environment that GitHub Actions provides, right? Yeah. So like, how much work would it be to get this to work in that environment, basically? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I think so. This uh, The Z3 solver is available as a package for Linux, so I think that should be uh, pretty straightforward. Yeah, you were just talking about like push button, right? So like, right. I would just suggest to look into GitHub Actions. Yeah. It's available in major distributions, I assume, right? Uh, the, the SMP solver itself? Yeah. Yeah, as a package, yes, exactly. Perfect. Uh, one more question, like from the bugs that you found in the old kernels, are there some commonalities, specific areas where you think, uh, okay, review, like it, it wasn't found in reviews, but then it needs to be more attention on, on, on that or any takeaways from the bugs that you found? So, I think we found that uh, the jump, uh, one of the major, obviously the major kernel versions, there was a lot of change was 5.7 RC1. Uh, and 
generally we find we found that the jump instructions are the ones which are uh, which, which also take the longest to verify but also are the ones which were most buggy uh, and i mean it's 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 the logic is also pretty complicated compared to alu instructions so that's what that's the general pattern we observed uh, but yeah happy to discuss some any other patterns uh, we have Perfect, really awesome work. Thank you very Thank much. You.